When hunting for what works in life, we often look for a certain key or a process, something very definite, that when I do this thing, this series of actions, good things happen almost all the time, or maybe all the time when I do these things. When I deviate from these things, bad things happen. The process is key. Uh, what we do and the way we do it are very important, but it's driven by outcome. We want good outcomes. When I go back nearly 50 years, I was a simple bench chemist doing some R&D. And the person I remember the most is one of the people I met the first, and that's Gus, who was the seasoned chemist. He was the director of R&D from the East Coast headquarters. And he would come out periodically. He was my uh, trainer, my mentor. And he would come out periodically. To, we would conduct experiments. He would explain the principles to me when I started out, the different compounds, how they would interact, the reaction mechanisms, we call it. I had the knowledge base, but I had very little experience. My job uh, would be, that's what a bench chemist does, is to put together compound domain components for best outcome and do trials over and over and over again and make sure what worked and what not so much. What worked well over and over again. Upon Gus's arrival, I prepared different processes for his inspection and the trial runs so that he could see what the results were. He had this very strange habit. I want to warn you ahead of time, do not do this at home. Do not do this at home. Just picture, if you would, all these hot beakers, leader beakers, with these green and brown looking substance, liquid substances in them, uh, very warm. And he would take his finger and dip it in one of the solutions and touch his finger to his tongue. I couldn't believe it. And he would look at me and say, that looks good. I think that's going to work. And it usually was, was right. He'd say, this one seems just right. It usually was. The sad part was, the crazy part was, these solutions were highly acidic and cyanide-based. Only later did I notice that he was switching his fingers. I was young. I admitted I was stupid. But it was still a very seminal moment for me. And I always remember the formula was set. It was never modified except by certain conditions but the basic formula always held. We're today going to study such a practice in the book of Acts, a simple but extremely powerful process. And now we move in our series to Acts chapter three. Pentecost and its events are in our rearview mirror. We move from the, day, from the big event of Pentecost two to the day to day. So after Pentecost, now what? What would the disciples do? Where would they go? They'd been given great miracles. Thousands of people had been baptized and believed, a true gift of the Spirit. And we enter when now one of the most pivotal points, one of the most pivotal points or sections in the entire Bible. Acts chapter 2 usually gets all the ink. Everybody remembers an Acts 2. They call it an Acts 2 ex experience. It is the Pentecost miracle. God, through Jesus Christ, gives the power to speak language and people are changed. But if you thought Acts 2 was, was critical, and it very much is, the events of Acts 3 are very, very impressive. And both chapters follow this very close, repeated pattern to an extreme degree. And we'll see if you can't pick it up. So today we'll see the disciples living in a Roman and religious Babylon, carving out their faith on a day-to-day -day basis, using a singular pattern and a using a very powerful tool that we have at our disposal, a name. We have an added feature in Acts chapter 3 in that we are entering the season of trumpets. See if you can spot the relevance to this section in Acts chapter 3. So today, the title is Living in Babylon, Acts chapter 3, the name. So let's begin. Chapter 3, beginning in verse 1. Now, Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they had laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple, who, seeing Peter and John go about to go into the temple, asked for alms. So picture this, if you would. It's very interesting. There's a word here in these few short verses that is, are repeated four times. Do you see it? It's very interesting. Peter and John have just been given the Spirit of God in this Pentecost experience. If we were to ask mainstream Christianity or from their perspective, we'd say, what next? You just won the Super Bowl. You are Acts chapter two. 
what are you going to do next? Well, I'm going to go to Walt. Di no, we're going to go to the temple to pray. We are going to go up to the temple to pray. That's what we're going to do. Huh? The temple, why the temple? That's the word mentioned four times. And at 3 p.m. prayer service. How Jewish? No. How biblical? There is nothing, however, in the law to describe this action, so why go? Much like Tevye in, in the, the Fiddler on the Roof, he said, tradition. But it's a good tradition. Tradition was that three times a day prayer was made twice during the sacrifices and once one other time it's based on we won't turn there but if you want further study psalm 55 verse 17 and our last series daniel 6 verse 10 both of those talk about this custom to pray three times a day morning midday and evening later it was formally set in the jewish canon of the oral law and so what's wrong with it not to me not a thing it's probably a good regimen something to uh, replicate it's a good custom, a good tradition. So this is what the disciples did. They continued to attend the temple, though, as we will see in the book of Acts, for different reasons from before. The temple stood, so they went. Verse 2 says there was a lame man laid there at the temple at the very entrance from birth, lame. We will read later in Acts chapter 4, where this issue comes up again. He was over 40 years old. So for 40 years or thereabouts, at least since he was old enough to get there and ask people to, to take him there, he'd been laid near the entrance. Picture this, a man unable to walk from birth at all for decades, every day carried to the temple. He was carried to the temple to beg for people as they walked in. He had to figure out how he got home as well as figure out how he got there. And there was all the, the issues of being in one place for a prolonged period of time. What if that occurred when, as you entered the services today in Rose City or any place that you worship God? If you would seen that, it had been very troubling indeed, very sad. And it'd be hard to, to walk around it. But this is the situation that the disciples find themselves immediately after Pentecost on their way to the temple. In verse 3, it says, their eyes locked. Verse three says, verse three and fix, verse three says they're about to go into the temple and ask for alms. Turn now to verse four. In verse four, it says, and fixing his eyes on him, the layman, with John, Peter said, look at us. So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but I, what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they, they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Verse 11. Now, as the lame man who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's porch, greatly amazed. So picture this scene. This lame man is laying there at the temple entrance. Peter looks at him and says, I'm broke. I ain't got anything. I got no silver. I got no gold. I got no money. I'm busted. But what I have is something far, far better. And then he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, very interesting phrase, which we don't see very often. He says to rise and walk. Remember this name. You will not see it quite like this again. But in a way, you will. And a wonderful miracle had occurred. No longer would he be lame and have to beg. He leaps. He clings to them and enters the temple. He says, praising God. It would be fascinating. And we saw this in Acts chapter 2. Praising God. What did he say? We just aren't told. I'm sure he said, thank you, God, and honored God, and lifted God's name up. Thank you, God, as he praised God. And isn't that exactly what we said we would do in praying? It should be the very first thing, because this is such a tremendous example, that when we have a miracle of any kind, small or great, especially when we can tie it to prayer, first, we praise God. 
first, we remind ourselves to thank God. We've had them in our family. You've had them in yours. And you can recount them as I'm saying this. I will guarantee you that they are running through your mind as we discuss this. So we praise our God. We thank him. Because again, it is what we said we would do when we made the prayer, more than likely. We've had a couple of prayer requests recently in Rose City. And I counted, and each and every time they said, we will honor and praise your name when we do this. And so this is exactly what happens here. So this tremendous example. This series of events we've seen before this pattern. Peter and John are present, then a miracle, then wonder and amazement by the crowd. But there's more. Let's continue and read verse 12. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people. Now, as we read this, where have you read this before? Almost word for word. So when Peter saw it, this reaction, he responded to the reaction of the people. Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us? As though by our own power or godliness, we have made this man walk. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. Do you see the parallel with Acts chapter 2? But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. Acts chapter 2, verse 32. And his name, through faith in his name, it's repeated, has made this man strong, whom you see and whom you know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Verse 17. Yet now, brethren, I know that you did it in ignorance, as you also did, also did your rulers. But those things which God foretold by the mouth of all his prophets, that the Christ would suffer, he, he, has, been, he has thus fulfilled. Repent, Acts 2.38, now verse 19. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus, who was preached to you before, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets, since the world began. These are such powerful words, and they fit this pattern again, down to the specific actions of Acts chapter 2. As we stated, they have these similar events. Peter's present. There is a miracle. Amazement by the crowd. Peter responds. He proclaims Jesus as fulfillment of multiple Old Testament prophecies. And we'll see more. The people we will see respond still later, just as they did. And it's big. Just like Acts chapter 2, it's a big response. Really big. We, I think there's at least six and I've, I've got a grid. I won't, I won't show it to you in PowerPoint. Just trust me. If you'd like to get a copy of it, I'll be glad to send it to you. I count at least six components, possibly as many as 13. In verse 12, it says, they marvel. Peter says, why do you marvel? It's not us. God through Christ, whom you delivered up. Again, as Acts chapter 2, we see this in Acts chapter 3. He does not hold back in any way, shape, or form from making accusation of this crowd. You delivered him up. He says in verse 13 and 14, and this is really fascinating. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, whom his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate, when he was determined to let him go. Fascinating. Peter says, you denied him. He accuses the, the, the crowd of not acknowledging who Jesus Christ was, and they denied him. Ironically, Peter should know. Peter knows all about denial. It's in the pages of the New Testament of the Gospels. Three times Peter denied Christ. Three, three times. Peter, I don't know what was going through his mind. That's one of the worst things to do is try and psychoanalyze the characters of the Bible, but I can only imagine what he might be thinking. What's fascinating here is the word here, deny, or naomi, is used of, of Peter in all three cases, the same exact word of denial. 
In verse 15, as we noted, it says they were witnesses of the resurrection. We were there, Peter said. We saw this. That's what makes the sign of an apostle. He who has partaken in the sighting of the resurrection, the exalted Christ. That is one of the signs of the, the apostleship. And so there are witnesses. We were there. We saw him resurrected. But the verses also throughout, Peter uses something very interesting. And I doubt that you could find a more concentrated area for the multiple names of Jesus. I count at least seven or eight, possibly nine, just in these verses 12 through 21. In verse 13, he's called the servant and also Jesus. Verse 14, he's called the holy one. Also the just, we'll see this term later in Acts used. In verse 15, he is the prince, or in some translations, the author of life. In verse 18, the Christ. Verse 20, Jesus Christ. They all say the same thing of the same person, but they do it from different perspectives. They give different aspects, but it is always all toward one person. They're not talking about, Peter's not talking about seven or eight different people. He is talking about one individual. The name of Jesus Christ and all its related descriptions are this one man. God's suffering servant is referenced in the book of Isaiah. The phrase, the holy one, the Hakodesh, is Psalm 22, verse 16. With Psalm 22, as you know, we won't turn there, uh, pictures a lot of the events of Jesus Christ's resurrection. He calls him the just one, the righteous one, the prince or the author of life. The book of John, first chapter, talks about God created or made creation through his son, Jesus Christ. It is the central theme of this chapter, the name of Jesus Christ, and carries on through the book of Acts. In fact, Acts chapter four, this name causes a tremendous controversy. Then it is all about the name. In Acts chapter three, nothing happens in this chapter unless healing occurs, and it is through this name. We've talked in the past, I've discussed with you the concept of name theology. Name theology is a growing concept in studies because God has many names. We talk about when we get to the feast, as you well know, where and other feast sites, and that's just the Feast of Tabernacles, where God places his name. He is there. He places his name on us. But God has many names. Yahweh, Yahovah. I can tell you one that it is not his name, and that is Jehovah. That is not a name. There is no J in Hebrew. But Yahweh, phonetically, again, two or three different ways. The Almighty, the Eternal, the Father, all refer to a single individual. And you know exactly who we're talking about when I say the Father. Is Jesus God? Is, is the Father God? The answer is yes. They both are. Are both Yahweh? As we can see in the Old Testament, it can be easily proven. The names are often interchangeable. They act in many, many ways in concord one with another. And we'll see this also, this word Yahweh translated Lord uh, in, in the New Testament. We'll see it in Acts. But they are distinct. They are separate, yet they are one. There is a unifying force between them. Persons can have multiple names. For instance, the, my wife that you know is Becky, I know as her as my sweetie. So I call her every once in a while my sweetie. Uh, my name, Jonathan, uh, was not orig my original name, or at least it wasn't the name my father wanted. My mom wanted Jonathan, and so was Jonathan. My dad wanted me to be called Sam. For what reason, I'm still not sure. So for the first six or seven years, my name, he called by my dad anyway, my name was Buckshot. Don't, don't ask why. It's a long story. I may have repeated this story, but that's what happens when you get old. There is other names that we can use. In fact, I'm sure you were called many names, especially at school, when you were young. People can have many names, but there is no inherent power and massive meaningful power in those names. No inherent godly or godlike power except the name of Jesus Christ and the Father's name. That's what's important. Did you notice that in the opening prayer today to show you how powerful these names are? And probably when you pray on your own, 
But 99.9% of prayers begin with God and they end with the name of Jesus Christ. We bookend, as it were, those two names. God, we mean the Father. That's who we pray to more times than not. And we end it with the name more times than not with Jesus. But verse 16 is in many ways the crux. Let's re read it again. Verse 16 says, and his name, his name through faith in his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. The word, the word name is used twice. The faith which comes through him has given him. Who is this person? Though it is not specifically named, they're talking about Jesus Christ. That is the inherent power of this name. Faith in this name, this man is healed. There is power in the name of Jesus Christ. Is there something wrong with using this phrase? Not flippantly or in casual conversation, but is it wrong to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ? Indeed not. Peter and the apostles, you will see in this chapter, the entire book of Acts, had no qualms about it. In fact, it cost them dearly, but they said it appropriately at the right time and with great meaning. So indeed not. But I often feel that sometimes the biblical phrase that we see in the Bible, like praising God or using Jesus's name, had been hijacked from us. They've been almost stolen from us that if this group uses them, then we can't use them. It's off limits because we'll be associated with them. Not so, because we allow it. I don't believe it, that we allow it. Just because others seemingly overexpress, underexpress, mispronounce, misexpress, does not mean we do not use these names at all. Praise God and praise him for all his wonderful works. And there are many in each of us, as you know. But I have a question for you, kind of a side question in this dialogue. Who had the faith in the name of Jesus? We know that Peter and John, absolutely, they had the faith in this name. They'd seen it work in the past. But did this man? Hmm, we're just not told. The implication is, yes, somehow, some way, this man possibly knew, because it says faith in his name has restored this man. So both the giver and the receiver are involved. Definitely the giver, Peter and John, in this case. We just don't know. But Peter's not done yet. He then gets even deeper in these prophetic issues. And I want you again to watch the names that are used of Jesus Christ. So in verse, beginning in verse 19, he says, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord that he may send Jesus Christ who has preached to you before whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things which God has spoken by the mouths of his holy prophets since the world began. Verses 19 and 21, aside from the word repent, uses some peculiar sets of phrases. The times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord, he may send Jesus Christ. The times of restoration, a time when the earth will be restored and refreshed from heaven. In many of the commentaries that I consulted, this phrase, especially the older ones, seemed to, seem to befuddle them, seem to confuse them. But in the newer, the newer expository commentaries, especially the Expositor's Greek Testament, it's clear. It states, this phrase or this expression here refers not only to the fact that Jesus was the appointed Christ or the Messiah, the expectant Messiah, but also to the return of Jesus as the Christ. Now, get that? But also to the return of Jesus as the Christ, the Messianic King at his parousia or his appearance in accordance with the voices of the prophets. They're talking about his return. We know it as the day of trumpets, according to the prophets, that Christ will return with the sound of the trumpet, the dead will be raised. Jesus, as these verses state very clearly, is with God. He's with the presence, which is God the Father. He is in heaven, and he's going to leave that presence He's going to leave heaven to return to earth, to return to be with mankind and to be with God the Father. The seasons are refreshed. It is a brand new age. And in a short time, we will celebrate what all that that day commemorates. 
What's interesting is while we celebrate trumpets, we still live in this type of Babylon, as we will see the apostles live in their own very peculiar Babylon. We live in one that is culturally and religiously bought Babylon. Do you wish this new time of refreshing, this time of restoration to come? Do you really wish it to come? Because we've got it, brethren, very good. Right where you're sitting, most of us that are hearing this message on Zoom, we live in a protected environment. We usually have got the air conditioning going or the fans are going. We really don't lack for want of food or water and we are protected. But others around this world are not protected. Millions and millions. So do we really wish it to come? It's pretty clear that Peter did and John did, all the apostles did. But do you wish his appearing for yourself, your family, the world? Because trumpets eventually delivers a time of unbelievable refreshing, of newness, newness. The world as we know it will change forever when Christ returns as these verses picture. And so we continue in Acts chapter three. Now again, here's these new, more new phrases. In verse 22, for Moses truly said to the fathers, the Lord your God, will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear in all things, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yes, and all the prophets from Samuel and those who follow, as many as have spoken, have also foretold these days. You are sons of the prophets. And of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all families of the earth shall be blessed. To you first, God having raised up his servant Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from your iniquities. There is, there is so much here. Peter now introduces this well-known phrase of the prophecy of the prophet, Deuteronomy 18. There shall arise a prophet like unto me, him you shall listen to, him you shall hearken to. It's Deuteronomy 18, verses 15, and those in context. Recall John chapter 1. Just picture it in your mind. We need not turn there. It's a very vivid story. In John chapter 1, the book of John, the scribes and the Pharisees ask John the Baptist as he is going around proclaiming, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. They ask the Baptist, are you the prophet? Are you that prophet? Are you the one? They're talking about Deuteronomy 1815, the very verses that Peter is quoting to the crowd in Acts chapter 3. It was called at the time the Messianic expectation. This prophet, this Moses had prophesied that this individual, this prophet would arrive after him, the greatest of all prophets, the prophet of prophets, the one, the holy one, the just one. John the Baptist answered, no, I am not that one, but Jesus Christ was. He was the fulfillment of this prophecy as the prophet. Then ends, Peter does, with another prophecy of Genesis chapter 21, the blessing of Abraham. God's servant is the fulfillment of the prophecy. And notice the names that are named of Jesus. He's got another, more names. He's now called a prophet, the prophet. He's now called servant Jesus. And this servant Jesus that had been prophesied in Isaiah chapter 60, 61, 62, he would come that you, Peter says, would be blessed, that you would be special. And by inference, that we would be blessed, and that we would be special. There is, as we shall see, no other name under which man can be saved. God through the name of Jesus Christ. In chapter four, we will, won't turn there. You can read ahead, obviously, if you'd like. It tells us that those who heard Peter's words now number 5,000. There was 3,000 at Pentecost in Acts chapter two. So either 2,000 additional to Pentecost, 3,000 or 5,000 new, or 5,000 brand new. Still huge, huge numbers. Add me to the church daily, I'll say by the hundreds. 
Either way, there is this power of belief and salvation in this name of Jesus Christ. So let's conclude. It's going to be a long conclusion, so settle in. Peter has developed this pattern that works. It is a formula. It is surely not rote because we will see it that it is not set in stone. But we will see this process, something that worked over and over and over again in the book of Acts. The name of Jesus Christ, this concept of Jesus as the Messiah, the concept of Jesus as the expected one, the holy one. They were all wrapped up in him. The name is never apologized for. It is never denied. It is never hidden. The name and the facts that are used with Gentiles, with God-fearers, with believing Jews, and even, as we will see in this book, Romans. All, much of it, this type of formed Babylon that the apostles are in. A system opposed to this name. The Romans were opposed. The Jews were opposed. The Gentiles didn't understand. And so this type of Babylon, we see the disciples, the apostles, working their way through. Often we find that their use of the name is reactive more than proactive. There's both, but we'll see there's a, a reaction by using this name, almost as a defense mechanism, because there's protection and there's power in this name. And we'll see this over and over and over again for Acts. But I have a final question for you. When we use the, the name, when we use the word the name, what is your reaction to it? In the law, in God's law, one of the chief commandments, the ninth, is bearing false witness. Turn there, turn there with me, if you would, to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20 and verse 16. We'll pick it up. We'll pick it up in 13 and have a running start into the uh, into 16. So Exodus chapter 20, verse 13. It says, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. But Exodus 16, verse 16 is what I want to concentrate on. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. The word bear is not an animal. It's a term that means speech. The bear's not, it's not an animal, but it's talking about giving an answer, giving speech. We should not speak or give false testimony or give false representation or false documents. But this particularly says to speak. In the original Hebrew means to speak or to give an audible answer. But look at command number three, Exodus chapter 20, verse 7. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Takes his name. What does takes his name mean? Since childhood, and Mr. Budge's reference to my childhood, I thought this, this will fit in. Uh, uh, and uh, he's probably a little closer with the story about my childhood than he realizes. But since childhood, we've all been told, don't swear. Don't speak using God's name in any way, shape, or form. Don't swear. Now, my childhood was quite colorful. We won't go into the details, but it was a very religious household. If that's the reason, if that was the do not take his name as vain, if that was the only reason, my question to you even today well, what happens? How do we answer if the hammer is really, really heavy? And my aim is not very, very good. And my thumb is in the way. And it is hit. Then am I justified in saying it? You're still not. You're still guilty. But is that the only thing it means? speaking or swearing in God's name in vain. If that's the reason, it's very narrow. But the word take here has other meanings. In fact, in chapter 20, verse 7, 
Speech is not mentioned. The prior verse 16, definitely, and you can look this up, the word there is, relates to speech. But not in this verse. In verse 20, verse, chapter 20, verse 7, speech is not an issue. There's a book I stumbled upon that's quite uh, interesting. It's Carmen Imes, Bearing God's Name, Why Sinai Still Matters. It's a development, a popularized version of her doctoral thesis on the, uh, the term, the name command. Um, and I would almost highly recommend it. It's got some areas in it which we would not disagree with. That it is vastly in agreement with our theology. It's a very popular book. What she says, and the, the concept is not original to her about bearing God's name. It has to do with prior studies of those uh, academics in the 70s and 80s. It looks at an additional meaning of this word. The meaning or the concept is expansive with this word. It's related to what we say, the name command. And in many ways, this other meaning is more strict, it's more encompassing, and it's legally more covenant binding. The word is nasa, and per Brown, Driver, and Briggs, it means to carry, to lift, to bear, to carry or to lift or to bear. Of the 600 plus uses of this word, over two thirds of them are translated bear or carry or lift or take something that's being carried physically or something that is with someone. I'm states that the law, and she has a very high view, very welcoming, very high view of the law. She speaks to this fact that God has placed his name, God the Father and by extension, Jesus Christ on his people, on us. It can surely include speech, but it's more. This name, this person, this God the Father and Jesus Christ his son are who we bear, who we represent, who we identify with. We bear his name. We carry it. We are aligned with it. We lift it up. Acts 3 tells us this name is extremely powerful. This whole concept of God's name is powerful. It's not so much as a magic formula. That's not the point at all, though there were magic formulas. But the names in ancient Near East literature, the names of the other gods are hidden. They're mystical. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is very clear. He goes by one particular name, but he has many other names. But he's very open about those names. And those names are on his people. It's also interesting if you look at the way the high priest, and it's a good study of the, 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 uh, the, what the high priest wears from his helmet to the breastplate. He has God's name on his helmet, on, on the shroud over his head. Yahweh's name is there. In fact, it's La Yahweh, meaning belonging to God the Father, Yahweh as we know him. So God has placed his name in the law, and especially as it relates to the Aaronic priesthood. As we live in Babylon, it was, as we course through these, these times that we live in, and with this last week, even in the last couple of days, we can see how quickly chaos can ensue. We can see how quickly disaster is ever in front of us for a number of reasons. Those are secondary. But the world is a troubled place. And the last week, two weeks has shown us how troubled it can be so quickly, so rapidly. We live in Babylon, and we face the forces of Babylon from many different directions. And yet Acts chapter 3 tells us that we represent God and his son. What we do often speaks so much more loudly than what we say. It is one thing to say you're going to do something, how you're going to react to the poor, how you're going to act to your friends. We heard in the first message a very good example. I say I'm going to forgive them. Don't just say it. Do it. Do both. Because what we do and surely what we say are representations of who we are and who we represent, the name that we bear. Should we be confident when we bear it, when we represent it? In many cases, yes, we should. Very much so. Should we be prideful? Absolutely not. Should we be proud? Very much so. But be careful, because in Babylon, there are traps. As we go through the book of Acts, chapter after chapter after chapter, Babylon, or the forces of Babylon, 
will lay traps for the disciples, the apostles. And just as in Babylon that they faced, the Babylon that we face, we will stumble. We will say and do things that do not represent the father or his son adequately or appropriately. We will bring discredit and we must be very careful. We must always ask for strength. I can imagine the, the faith that Peter and John had in this episode in Acts chapter three. Though it is not stated, I will guarantee you almost equivoc not equivocally that Peter prayed. I imagine he prayed a lot. Often is not what we say, it is often what we do, but both are vitally important to the names we represent. Does God and his son Jesus Christ wish us to not only say their names honorably, but also to be worthy and do things so we are worthy to be known of it? Indeed he does. So hallowed is the names that we bear. Thank you and I wish you a very happy Sabbath.